Hi, welcome back to Dr. Donovan Medicine Made Easy. In this video, we're going to be covering everything that you need to know about mastoiditis, which is a inflammation or infection of the mastoid bone, which is the bone here behind the ear. In the video, we're going to be covering the anatomy of mastoiditis causes, as well as signs and symptoms, important investigations that you might want to carry out, as well as treatment options, and finally, some complications you want to watch out for. I've included loads of really helpful photographs throughout the presentation, and if you're a health professional, I've included lots of useful extra links in the description box of this video for extra reading, so please check those out. If you enjoy the video, remember to give it a thumbs up to help others find the video and subscribe to the channel for loads more useful information. So first of all, let's look at the anatomy. So the mastoid is part of the petreous temporal bone, and it's located posterior, so behind the middle ear. It's made up of cells that drain the middle ear, and you can actually feel your own mastoid process. So take your index finger, put it directly behind the ear and you'll feel a hard bit of raised bone and that's the mastoid process. So mastoiditis is associated with the progression of acute otitis media and that's infection which is spreading from here which is the middle ear and it goes into the mastoid air cell system. Initially there's hyperemia which is increased blood flow and edema of the mastoid air cell mucosa and that swelling blocks the effective drainage of the mastoid air cell system. That can lead to pearl and exudate collecting in things like the air cells and then increased pressure within the air cell system results in bone necrosis, pus gathers and an abscess cavity can form. So now let's take a look at what causes mastoiditis. Well mastoiditis is a complication of a middle ear infection and it happens when the infection in the middle ear spreads into the mastoid bone as we've just discussed and the most common cause is strep pneumonia. Now, just to see what you've got on screen here, this is a normal tympanic membrane. You can see the light reflex and some of the structures or bony structures of the middle ear. And here you've got an abnormal tympanic membrane. As you can see, it's very red and inflamed. And this is where the infection is. So now that you know some of the basic anatomy and causative reasons for mastoiditis, let's move on and take a look at the symptoms of mastoiditis. So the first one that you're going to be interested in is ear pulling, and you can see see this little girl here is tugging at her ear and in a young child who can't speak and articulate their symptoms you want to be looking out for this so pulling at the ear or feeling distressed they might be displaying ear pain so you want to ask the patient about ear pain or ask mum and dad has the child been pulling at their ear excessively or crying or looking distressed they might be generally unwell so they might have a temperature be off their food and you want to look out for a persistent fever so something that's not coming down with simple analgesia or things such as calpol and that's going to be above 38 degrees c or 102 degrees fahrenheit now let's look at some of the signs of mastoiditis that you're going to see on clinical examination. First one that you're interested in is this here and that's post auricular erythema so clear redness here as well as tenderness, swelling and fluctuance. You also want to look out for a pushed out pinna or pushed out ear and what you will see here, if you look behind a normal person's ear, you look for something called a sulcus which is a line or groove that runs down here and in mastoiditis the inflamed area is pushing out this pinna or the ear and you lose the sulcus. So next time you're behind a patient or a family or friend, just have a look and look for their sulcus and you'll see that in mastoiditis that disappears. You also want to look for evidence of sepsis, so things like a high temperature. Make sure you check the patient's temperature. So now we've looked at the symptoms and signs of mastoiditis, let's move on and take a look at how you diagnose it. So the diagnosis is largely clinical and the health professional is going to ask relevant questions in the history such as which ear is infected, whether or not the child or the patient has had a temperature or a recent ear infection and then they're going to move on and do a clinical examination of the ear looking out for the signs that we've just discussed and they'll also look inside the ear using an otoscope and they might see that bulging eardrum that we just saw back here in this slide. For those of you who are interested in performing otoscopy or how to do it, I've got another popular video on this channel of how to perform otoscopy and the link is going to come on screen and it'll be located up here. I've also put it in the description box for this video, so please feel free to check that out. So now let's move on and talk briefly about investigations and the two main things that might be done are blood tests as well as imaging. So I'm just going to switch to the pen mechanism and we're going to write down a couple of the important blood tests for later. So the first one that you're going to be interested in is a full blood count 
and a white cell count can be a reliable marker of infection and inflammation. The next tests that you're going to look at are use and ease or urea and electrolytes, and that's important to establish baseline renal function in case certain antibiotics are required. Next blood test that you might be interested in is a CRP, or C-reactive protein, and that is raised in the context of infection and inflammation. Next, it'd be worthwhile getting a lactate, and that's because a raised lactate is commonly associated with sepsis or severe inflammatory response syndrome, also known as SIRS. And finally, another useful investigation to do is a blood culture or a set of blood cultures. And that might help identify the cause to pathogen in severe infection with bacteremia, and it also help inform the choice of antibiotic agent. Now let's move on and talk briefly about imaging. Well, the choice of imaging in mastoiditis is going to be a CT scan. Indications for a CT scan would be a persistent high fever, despite 48 hours of medical management, so IV antibiotics, as well as any suspicion of complicated acute mastoiditis. Um, it can basically help to show the soft tissue or intracranial complications. So we're going to take a look now at a real CT scan. So in terms of typical findings on the CT scan, you might see um, partial to complete a pacification of mastoid air cells. So this CT scan shows acute left mastoiditis and a fluid accumulation with peripheral contrast enhancement and restricted diffusion is seen in the left mastoid as pointed out by this red arrow. Let's move on now briefly and talk about how mastoiditis is treated. So for treatment, if you're a student or a health professional watching this video, it's good to have a structure as to how you manage things, as I'm sure you're already aware. And I like to split it up broadly into immediate management, medical management, and surgical management. It's a good way to organize your thoughts and management plan. So first of all, let's talk about immediate management. Well, you want to resuscitate the patient if they're acutely unwell using the A, B, C, D, E approach, which is obviously airway, breathing, circulation, D for disability and E for everything else. And that's as per the ALS or APLS guidelines. So ALS or APLS, and that's advanced life support, advanced pediatric life support. Then you want to think about the sepsis six, and the really important thing with the sepsis 6 that you really want to think about in mastoiditis is giving appropriate antibiotics early as per the local guidelines. You want to think about keeping the patient nil by mouth in case they need to go to theatre for an operation. And you want to get an ENT review, ear, nose and throat or otolaryngology. They're the experts that you want to involve in the care of mastoiditis, as well as making sure you give the patient appropriate analgesia or pain relief in order both to lower the temperature and to try and control any pain that the patient might have. Let's move on now and think about medical management. Well, the main thing, as I've already stressed, is antibiotics, and that's the crucial thing in mastoiditis. The patient will need antibiotics in a confirmed case of mastoiditis. And you can look at local microbiology guidelines for that. But for example, you could give IV Piptaz or Tazacin or Metronidazole or Ciprofloxacin if the patient is penicillin allergic. Finally, let's move on and just talk briefly about different options for surgical management of mastoiditis. Well, the first thing that you can do is a tympanocentesis, which is removal of fluid behind the eardrum here. And the doctor will use a special needle with a tube attached to collect the sample of fluid, and then a culture and sensitivity test is usually done on this sample. Another option is to put a T-tube in, so the surgeon will make a small incision in the tympanic membrane here, and they'll insert a round little plastic tube to let the pus come out from behind the tympanic membrane and try relieve some of the infection. One of the final or most sort of severe management cases that you might want to do if you're an ENT surgeon is something like a cortical mastoidectomy, which is a surgery to remove cells in the hollow air-filled spaces in the skull behind the ear where the mastoid bone is. In terms of follow-up, well, outpatient follow-up is usually arranged one to two weeks after for a wound review if the surgical management's performed, and patients should also undergo pure tone audiometry or PTAs to check their hearing to exclude persistent conductive hearing loss. What can you be doing to prevent mastoiditis? Well, mastoiditis is a complication, remember, of the middle ear infection. So it's important to treat the ear infection before it spreads to the mastoid bone. Let's just talk very briefly now to finish off the presentation about potential complications. Well, complications of mastoiditis are classified by the direction of spread of the infection, either deeper into the temporal bone, 
intracranial as well as extracranial. One of the main ones that I think you really need to know about and watch out for is a facial nerve palsy. And you can see this lady here has a facial nerve palsy on the right hand side. Again, I've done a video on this channel about how to assess the facial nerve and you might want to check that out if you're interested in that. Let's just quickly talk about prognosis. Well, mastoiditis has got good prognosis in uncomplicated disease with no intracranial extension. Usually these facial nerve palsies are transient, but obviously this is a case by case or patient by patient basis. Conductive hearing loss usually resolves with the infection unless there's significant destruction of the middle ear structures. So that brings us to the very end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel and share this with your friends. If you've got any questions or feedback, remember to leave a comment in the comment section below. And until next time, bye.